empezar mi historia desde el principio, diré que nací, según me han dicho y yo lo creo, un viernes a las 12 en punto de la noche. Y cosa curiosa, el reloj empezó a sonar yo a gritar simultáneamente. Teniendo en cuenta el día y la hora de nacimiento, la enfermera y algunas comadronas del barrio, que tenían puesto un interés vital en mí bastantes meses antes de que pudiéramos conocernos personalmente, declararon, primero, que estaba predestinado a ser desgraciado en la vida, y segundo, que gozaría del privilegio de ver fantasmas y espíritus. Según ellas, estos dones eran inevitablemente otorgados a todo niño, de un sexo o de otro, que tuviera la desgracia de nacer en viernes y a medianoche. Esta es la antigua cocina de la casa donde nació Charles Dickens. Actualmente es la tienda de la casa museo. Aquí solamente vivió durante los cinco primeros meses de su vida y más tarde la familia se mudó a otras casas. Estuvo viviendo en la ciudad de Portsmouth aproximadamente unos dos años más. Eh, so, los años eh, vividos en Portsmouth son considerados como los años más felices para la familia Dickens. Después de eso se mudaron a Londres y más tarde a Kent, ya que trasladaron al padre de Charles a los astilleros de Kent. John Dickens is the father of Charles Dickens and he worked in this building here and he was a pay clerk. He was looking after the administration and the money and the accounts for the dockyard. Charles was aged five when his father worked here for the first time and for the next four years we've been a regular visitor coming in and out to meet his father. During that time, he met all sorts of characters, dockyard workers, army, navy, royal marines, and the trades that you needed to build a ship. Just here, the first iron ship built for the Royal Navy, HMS Achilles, was built. These memories that he, from all of the things that he was seeing, including on the river, in great expectations, you had the ships that were prison ships, down on the river here and they were floating prisons and the uncommercial traveler a chapter in that book is all about a walk through the dockyard Los primeros tiempos de Dickens en Londres no fueron especialmente buenos. De hecho, con 12 años ya trabajaba en una fábrica de betún, mientras su padre era encarcelado por moroso. De esa lucha de clases habla precisamente en varios de sus libros, como en Tiempos difíciles, la que para muchos es su novela más comprometida socialmente. De ese compromiso y de esa lucha, y de otras muchas cosas, vais a oír hablar en el Museo de la Ciudad. Permitidme que os indique la taberna más próxima donde dan bien de comer. Y cogiéndole del brazo, le condujo por Ludgate Hill hasta Fleet Street, 
le hizo pasar bajo unos soportales y entró con él en una taberna. Allí los acomodaron en un pequeño reservado, donde Charles Darney no tardó en recobrar sus extenuadas fuerzas gracias a una buena cena regada con buen vino, mientras que Carton, sentado frente por frente a la misma mesa, con su botella de oporto delante, bebía con aquel aire suyo medio apático, medio insolente. ¿Os vais dando cuenta de que pertenecéis otra vez a este bajo mundo terrenal, señor Darney? Estoy en una confusión terrible por lo que hace a tiempo y lugar, pero al menos me doy perfecta cuenta de que estoy vivo entre los vivos. Dickens portrayed Victorian London and obviously he looked at the extremes of Victorian London. He looked at the extremes in particular of the wealth and the poverty that he saw um, as he walked through the streets. But of course he was a novelist and his novels are his interpretation of London at the time. The way he described some of London's characters was very, very real, and a lot of people would have recognised um, some of the characters that he described. He, he expressed the diversity of London's population, uh, the way that a lot of people had come to live in the city at that time, from all parts of the UK, their accents, their dialects, the way they spoke. The River Thames during Dickens' time was really the heart of London. It was a wealthy working river, of course the London's port was the largest port in the world. London was the wealthiest city in the world. Dickens always loved walking around the back streets. And so he would walk around the streets, the back streets, he would um, like to go into areas that perhaps were even dangerous to go into and um, he would really enjoy discovering these areas, looking at the conditions, the way people lived in them. And many of these descriptions then fed into his novels. If Dickens were alive today, I think he would be writing about many of the similar things that he was writing about in the 19th century. Obviously, poverty is still a feature of London life, always was and always will be. Uh, we still today use the term Dickensian to describe many of the conditions that Londoners are living in today. Uh, the poor housing, the overcrowding, and I think these would have been issues that he would have been very interested in. He was also very interested in the 19th century about government bureaucracy, red tape as he called it and the sort of inefficiencies of government and of course that's something that many of us still criticize today he would have also looked at family life because in the 19th century many of the families that he described were what we might call dysfunctional um, there were lots of step parents there were lots of orphans there were lots of um, problems in family life and of course these are things that um, are still very much relevant to the lives of many of us today. Please, give 
give me a second face I've fallen far down First time around Now I just sit on the ground in your way Estamos en pleno Covent Garden, donde la pequeña Dorrit suele pasear a menudo cuando va a la casa donde trabaja de criada. Y es que aquí Dickens vuelve a abordar uno de sus temas favoritos, la lucha de clases. Estoy convencido que la pequeña Dorrit le hubiera encantado vivir en otra época. Y quién sabe si también visitar un lugar como este. This is Dickens World, welcome to Dickens World. Dickens World is an attraction, a theme of attraction based around Charles Dickens' his life and his works, primarily here to give people an idea of what it used to be like in Victorian London about 150 years ago. And we try to give them a little idea of that Dickens isn't just Oliver Twist, but that there are other stories that Dickens wrote and we tell them about them so that they can hopefully take that away and start reading these other stories either at school or by themselves or with their parents. The idea really is to give you an idea of Dickens times in London. Over there we have for example a Victorian schoolroom which is based on Charles Dickens' schoolroom in his famous book, Nicholas Nickleby. Nicholas Nickleby goes to work for a Yorkshire boarding school where a wicked, a wicked headmaster called Watford Squeers operates, treats his boys very, very badly, and that schoolroom there represents what it must have been like in a Victorian schoolroom at that time. Welcome to the Haunted Man. Come and be, we'll go up the stairs together. Muchos niños conocen a Dickens gracias a su famoso cuento de Navidad. ¿Quién no ha vivido la historia del tacaño Scrooge, el único tipo de todo Londres que nunca, nunca ha celebrado la Navidad? Bueno, pues el que quiera conocer los motivos, en su casa deberá entrar. Observó Oliver que el truán tenía la mala costumbre de arrebatar las gorras de las cabezas a los pobres niños que por su lado pasaban y tirarlas dentro de las tiendas. Mientras Bates, cuyas nociones acerca de los derechos de propiedad parece que eran excesivamente amplias, daba pruebas de habilidad maravillosa para trasladar manzanas y cebollas de los cestos de los vendedores a sus propios bolsillos, que al parecer, más que bolsillos, debían ser alforjas. Acababan de salir de un pasadizo estrecho poco distante de la plazoleta abierta de Clerkenwell llamada hoy, merced a una perversión singular de la palabra la verde, cuando el truán cesó de andar bruscamente y aplicando un dedo a sus labios, indicó a sus compañeros que retrocedieran con la mayor cautela y circunspección. La noche es un buen momento para leer La Casa Lugubre, una historia donde encontramos los temas habituales de Dickens, la corrupción, la injusticia y todo eso ambientado en las zonas más deprimidas de la gran ciudad. Mezcla de humor y melodrama, estamos ante una novela muy, muy oscura.
Americans described David Copperfield as his favorite child. And his children said as well, if you want to know our father's favorite child, you need to look at David Copperfield. And this was is often described as Dickens' most autobiographical novel. And it is. I mean, there are many elements to it that are autobiographical. Even the initials, David Copperfield, DC, are Charles Dickens' own initials reversed. Um, obviously, it's not a true telling of his family life. Um, his father didn't die when he was before he was born. Um, his mother didn't marry a, a wicked stepfather. The main autobiographical elements of David Copperfield, I think, are the emotions that David feels. Some of the experiences, um, for example, when he becomes to befriend the Micawber family and Mr. Micawber is taken off to prison, that is very illustrative of John Dickens, Charles's father, being taken to prison. In fact, Mr. Micawber, one could say, is John Dickens to the life. He put his father into this character and we're meant to like him. Dickens always said his father was, was never a bad person, there was no malice in him. His parents were good people, they just were terrible with money. <laughs> One of the causes that Charles Dickens was very keen on was the international copyright law. And the first time he went to America, he took with him a letter signed by 25 really important writers. Now, the reason being that there was no agreement between publishers in Britain and America. So any British authors were being published illegally in America. The authors got no royalties at all. It was a bit like pirate music or books today on the internet. He, he wrote his books not as complete novels, he wrote them in chapters or episodes and when he started publishing the first of those he hadn't finished writing the whole of the book yet. Um, that's what made his writing so fresh and so exciting that he was still writing it actively every month before people saw the next instalment. So, as I say, when he began, he didn't necessarily know what the ending would be. And even if he had a plan, that would often change as the characters started to grow and they started to kind of get a life of their own, as it were. Um, I think if he were alive today, he would use the internet fully, but I also think he would be very, very hot on whether he was getting all his royalties or not. Charles Dickens was one of the very first people to whom the word celebrity was applied. It came into the Oxford Dictionary in 1849 and it was used to describe Charles Dickens because he was the kind of celebrity that nobody had seen before. This man who was born in a very humble family, who nobody had expected to become famous, somehow captured the imagination, not only in the UK but overseas as well. He first understood quite how famous he was when he went to America. He had his 30th birthday in America in 1842. He and his wife Catherine, they were still very happily married then, they went to America for six months and they travelled in Canada as well. And he said he would leave his hotel and people would follow him down the street. He was like the Pied Piper. People would carry scissors with them to try and, and clip um, locks of his hair from his head. Um, he said it was very strange. One morning his wife was lying in bed and he was in the bathroom shaving and this face appeared at the window and a man had climbed up the outside of the hotel to peer in and try and see Charles Dickens. That was how, when he started to realise how famous he was. When Charles Dickens died, he was only 58 years old. It was very unexpected and there was national mourning. People couldn't believe that Charles Dickens was dead. After this very private funeral was over, um, Charles Dickens's coffin was placed in the grave and the grave was kept open for two days inside Westminster Abbey. Where he is buried is called Poet's Corner and it's the area of Westminster Abbey that's dedicated to writers. So it was open for two days before the grave was filled in so that people could file past and pay their respects. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands of people came to Westminster Abbey. They walked from all over Britain um, to come to Westminster Abbey to see his grave. It was, it was a huge time of national mourning.
cuesta entenderlo, pero si visitáis Londres en este año del Bicentenario, no vais a poder entrar en la casa natal de Dickens porque está de obras. Cosa de las subvenciones, la burocracia y una acertadísima previsión. Pero lo que sí podéis hacer es acercaros hasta Sheffield Street, donde encontraréis este establecimiento, que le sirvió de inspiración a Dickens a la hora de escribir La tienda de antigüedades. Una historia que protagoniza la huerfanita Nell y su abuelo, que sobreviven como pueden vendiendo antiguayas. Por cierto, que el final conmocionó a muchísimos de sus lectores. Un final al que también nos acercamos, Camino de Ken. Llegamos al cabo de un cuarto de hora a casa de la señorita Havisham, toda de ladrillo viejo, aspecto triste y llena de barras de hierro. Algunas ventanas habían sido cegadas y de aquellas que quedaban, las inferiores tenían rejas oxidadas. En la parte delantera había un patio, también con rejas, de modo que tuvimos que esperar después de llamar a que alguien nos abriera. Mientras aguardábamos en la verja, me asomé entre los barrotes y vi que junto a la casa había una fábrica de cerveza en la cual no había actividad ni parecía haberse utilizado desde hacía mucho tiempo. Se abrió una ventana y una voz clara inquirió, ¿Quién llama? A lo cual mi guía contestó, Pambelchuk. Algunas novelas de Dickens toman diversos escenarios de esta pequeña localidad de Rochester, como esta famosa catedral, que aparece en varias ocasiones en el misterio de Edwin Drott, la novela inacabada del genial escritor inglés, una historia esperpéntica y tenebrosa que sin duda deberíais leer. Charles Dickens murió en 1870 en el condado de Kent y siempre manifestó que quería ser enterrado allí. Pero la grandiosidad de su figura fue una losa para sus deseos y por eso yace aquí, junto a otros ilustres, en la abadía de Westminster. Aunque eso sí, sus historias permanecerán vivas entre nosotros por los siglos de los siglos. Espero que mi juez misericordioso recordará mi pesado castigo en la tierra. 20 años, amigo mío. 20 años en esta tumba horrible. El corazón se me deshizo cuando murió mi hijo y no pude siquiera besarle en su pequeño ataúd. Mi soledad desde entonces, en medio de todo este ruido y estrépito, ha sido espantosa. Que Dios me perdone. Él ha visto mi muerte solitaria y abandonada. Cruzó las manos y, murmurando algo que no pudieron oír, cayó en un sueño. Al principio solo un sueño, pues le vieron sonreír. Susurraron juntos durante algún tiempo y el carcelero, inclinándose sobre la almohada, se echó atrás apresuradamente. «Ya está libre al fin, por Dios», dijo el hombre. Ya estaba libre, pero se había hecho tan semejante a la muerte durante la vida que no supieron cuándo murió. 